Um, so I think, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, give me a second to share the screen. And yeah, I will be talking about, um, well, the title is Towards Automated Procedures and Standardization with FDI Imaging and Machine Learning. Um, we are still far away from any kind of standardization and it will probably be a long way down. Um, but I want to give you an idea how this could look like in the future. I will skip the introduction. You have learned this already. And uh, I will also keep this brief, as you know, from the pro talk of Professor Follertson. Um, we use a spectrum that we get from our measurement for identification because this is like a chemical fingerprint and each polymer is unique. So we can um, identify them this way. And you have heard already about a chemical imaging. So this is um, a method for spatially resolving chemical properties. And we are collecting pixels where each pixel consists of a whole spectrum. And this can be done with a single element where you consecutively scan your area with a line array where you also do this in a consecutive scan or the way we prefer it to use a focal plane array where you have a full pixel array of up to 128 by 128 pixels, um, which is by far the fastest and also the most sensitive method when it comes to small particles. Okay, why are we actually turning our interest to FTIR? Um, this is because we think particles um, to know the identity size and count is um, very important to assess the biological threat they might pose. The smaller they are, the more dangerous they are in the end. And this is um, why we think particle size and a number is so important. Um, FTIR is a non-destructive technique, as we have learned. Um, there are other complementary methods. So if you start with FTIR, um, your sample is still intact for further investigation. We can measure any kind of sample. So no matter if it's drinking water or um, like the sewage sludge we have seen, and we can identify any kind of polymers and non-polymer particles this way. It's, well, we have learned that the pretreatment actually takes quite a lot of time, but in terms of measurement, this is one of the fastest methods to maintain results and most cost efficient. Um, to do this, we need FTR spectrometers. And for this, we have our LUMOS2 FTIR imaging microscope. This you see already, it's a compact standalone microscope uh, with a small footprint and also equipped with focal plane array detector. Um, we are measuring, as you've seen before, complete filters. We're not doing any other quartz or extraction. And the filters we are using are usually aluminum oxide. You can, of course, also use other ones, but these have um, proven quite to work quite well for us and also for many others. And um, you have the spectral region from 1250 to 4000 wave numbers available, which is sufficient to identify basically anything you have fit in your sample. Um, the sensitivity is down to five micron meters, as Professor Follertson pointed out. Um, we are not claiming to find all of them, but most of them, um, and we can detect five micrometer particles, but the um, limit where we say everything is possible is actually more around 10. Um, we can identify any kind of particles and we have a very high throughput. So we're collecting 700 spectra, 750 spectra per second at eight wave numbers and um, each with five micrometer pixel resolution. So we are operating at the diffraction limit and we'll find anything that is possible. And the measurement is automated and as well as the evaluation. This is really the part we're focusing on to get a um, yeah, procedure that is easy for everyone to use and also the evaluation, which can be quite time consuming and tricky as we have learned. And this evaluation we call, of course, is done based on spectral information. Um, so, so how would such a workflow look like? The part we cannot automate is the sample preparation. Um, this, this can be quite extensive, but it can also be relatively easy depending on your sample. So if you have drinking water or beverages, you probably just need to filter them and everything else needs to be pre-treated to different extents. Um, the next part is the filtration. Again, we're using aluminum oxide filters that are IR transparent and have small pore sizes. Um, so they will capture any kind of particle that is 
in your sample. Um, of course, we're again removing everything that's too large for FTIR imaging. And then the imaging itself, it's completely automated. Um, you just start the measurement and let it run. Uh, here you have another value of 900 spectra. This is for 16 wave numbers, but um, default is actually more eight wave numbers. And then the data evaluation, um, we're using machine learning to uh, have a way that is fully automated without user interaction. Um, so this is an algorithm that was trained on environmental samples and have been labeled by microplastics experts in the field. Um, we're using the software called Opus for our measurements. And just show, let me show you a small example of a larger anodisc filter. So the active area is actually around 18 millimeters. We have a slip ring here to um, make sure they're not falling apart. And this, what you see here, is a microscopic image stitched together, and all these red tiles are individual measurement tiles. So this is 121 by 121 fields of view of the FBA. We're collecting 1,024 spectra per tile with a pixel resolution of 5 micrometers. And this way, we're generating about 15 million MIR spectra. If you're using smaller ones, um, which also is recommended depending on your sample load, um, then you usually have 10 micrometers in diameter. This are around 4 million spectra and take about one hour 45 to measure. Um, another thing I want to highlight here is that we can tolerate quite a lot of debris on the sample. This does not mean um, that you can forego sample pretreatment, um, but it doesn't need to be perfect. So some remains are still okay. Just make sure there's nothing overlapping. So if particles are overlapping, um, then it's really difficult to tell them apart or identify them. But um, a basis of sand or so is not too bad at all. Okay, um, so this again is our visual image of the sample. And when you zoom in, you see here we have, um, well, quite a lot of particles. And when we apply our machine learning training, this, um, by the way, it's uh, Durancy the company we're working with, I will go into more detail that, um, we can find out, okay, where are the plastic particles? How many pixels do they occupy? And what size does this actually correspond to? So this is the information of an ABS particle overlaying on the visual image so you know where it actually is. And why are we using machine learning? Um, if you're using database correlations, um, it's a really difficult to find a standardized approach um, because it depends on the one hand on the database you're using and also um, the settings you may have to find your results so um, an operator can um, have a look at the results and think no that's not so nice um, i'll change some parameters and run it again before i create a report and we already know that results of the same sample can differ quite a lot between different laboratories, um, but also between different operators. And this is why, well, this is the one reason. And also the other is that it can be quite time intensive for large data sets. We have learned we're producing about 15 million spectra and the more reference spectra you have, the more time consuming it will be because all of the spectra will be compared to all of the references. And when we're using machine learning, we have a multivariate model and uh, that is trained on a real life data. So you're not comparing to a full set of spectra, but just to a pre-built classifier that has previously been trained. This is quite a lot of work actually um, that has to be done, but once it's finished, it's actually quite fast. Here we have no bias in decision-making because the whole process is automated and can also be accessed by anyone. Okay, so the basics of the approach, how does this work? Um, we start off with a decision tree. This is in the easiest case, a combination of yes and no questions and going, starting from the top, going down the line, you will end up with a result. And to make this one more robust, we actually take a lot of trees and create a forest from them. This is a random forest decision classifier. So you have a lot of different decision trees um, that will uh, work together and cast a majority voting to, and the majority will then determine what kind of 
well, in our case, Polymer, and this actually is. And this is a lot more robust than just using a single decision tree or um, other approaches. And here we are also having a certain speed increase. So we're not using the full spectra with all the information, but just spectral descriptors, uh, which look at part of the spectrum. And therefore we have less data to evaluate in the end. Uh, we're getting faster and disturbances in the spectra are, um, well, not so bad anymore because we can mostly ignore them. And there are two options to do this. Um, what you see here is a lot of polymer spectra on the top and a plot of the feature importance. So what spectral feature is uh, important to distinguish the different polymers? And they can pick individual wave numbers. Um, so you need a certain number of these and they can work together to identify them with this classifier, the polymer. Or there's another approach where you use spectral descriptors. They are not exactly the same, but very similar to integration areas. Um, which you can use in combination to get to the same result. And usually this is the preferable option. Okay, so I want to talk about the software itself. So this is actually a commercially available software. It's called the Purency Microplastics Finder. And um, here you load in your FTIR imaging data. This is the sample we have seen before. And you have three buttons, one for import, one for analysis and one for batch processing. And um, when you click on this, the computer will run for a time of around 15 minutes for a sample like this. And then you will be presented with your result. You have a list of particles, the um, number of particles per class, and you can freely roam around and look at the spectra and also compare it to reference spectra. And this is this zoomed in a bit more again. So here again is our ABS particle you see here. Um, well, here there should be a reference spectrum. And you also have quality criteria. So how well does it match to a reference spectrum? And how sure is the classifier that this is actually um, this certain type of polymer? Uh, you can also have any kind of um, size statistics available. So you can have width, length, area, um, distribution to yeah, learn more about your sample. And yeah, just a quick summary, we're measuring the filter, um, creating FTIR image. So this currently, uh, this image shows the um, organics, all the organics there that's not necessarily plastics. At the moment, this is everything that's organic particles. And then we can create a report from our result. So, um, what we're expecting from a standardization or a possibility to do this in the future, I want to be uh, a bit more vague about this. Um, we need a full automation of hardware measurement and evaluation, uh, which we have provided so far. It should be easy to handle, especially if you're in a routine lab. Um, if you have uh, an operator that has to use many different machines and cannot be focused just on this, um, specialized on this task, there we have a guided user interface and a step-by-step -step workflow to get from the sample to the result. Um, all particles must be found and properly identified. This is why we're measuring complete filters, operating at the diffraction limit with our pixel size and analyzing the full range of spectra or parts of the full range um, for these descriptors. We can measure any kind of sample. Um, FDA imaging tolerates a lot of debris. And we are having reliable and reproducible results on the one hand, because the instrument has a self-diagnosis and the software can also be um, double-checked with the quality criteria. Um, before I finish, I just want to give a brief outlook what's to come in the future. Um, QCL imaging is a hot topic. And if you compare it to the classical FTIR, um, you already know it's a full spectrum. We're having a thermal source that emits over a broad wave number range and we're collecting full spectra at once. And with QCL, we're focusing on single wavelength and not measuring, so sorry, QCL stands for quantum cascade laser. And this is a tunable mid-infrared laser source. Um, 
And this source can be tuned to different wavelengths. So this is not emitting over the whole range, but only one wavelength at a time. And if we remember our spectral descriptors, we could use this already to not measure full spectra, but gain a speed increase by just focusing on different uh, wave numbers. And we recently released the Hyperion 2 infrared laser imaging microscope, um, which has such a QCL source here in the box. Um, so we can measure individual wave numbers. QCL have a somewhat limited spectral range of 1800 to 950 wave numbers. Um, we can collect the wide field images with the detector we have, and we have a patented coherence reduction to remove artifacts that usually stem from a coherent laser source because of interference with itself. And here, this is an image collected um, with QCL. We only take 16 minutes for a full filter, also at eight wave numbers and five micrometers pixel resolution, albeit with the re reduced spectral range we see here. So there are some limitations with that. We're still exploring the options and the possibilities um, to use this. And as I said, we can run individual wave numbers. Uh, we only take around 50 seconds to complete uh, to measure the complete filter with one wave number. And here it's kind of a trade-off. So um, seeing how many wave numbers we need, we might as well um, scan the full filter if we have more than maybe 20 wave numbers that we need. Um, there's currently an ongoing project with the MonPlus. This is an EU-funded project uh, for the monitoring of plastics in the environment and aqueous samples. Um, you can check it out on the website. We have a um, PhD candidate here that's also working in cooperation with Professor Follotson. And he recently posted a video, um, if you follow them on Twitter, where he talks a bit more about this project. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to um, talk here. If you have any questions, yeah, you know, you can ask them now or you can write us an email if you are interested um, about more in-depth discussions. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for the nice presentation, uh, Dr. Siebel. Mm -hmm. I have one question in the chat box, which I can read for you. Okay. Uh, why are FTIR spectra collected here not comparable to FTIR databases? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, or maybe I wasn't clear enough in my talk. Um, there is no problem to compare FTIR spectra to databases. Um, this, this is nothing physically, or there's nothing hindering you to do it. Um, what I wanted to point out is that um, if you're using different databases, you might come to... Um, not exactly the same results depending on the spectra that are um, in that database. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is the smallest size that can be measured from uh, the LUMOS Hyperion 2000 and 3000 models? What is the best technique to measure microplastics from filtration uh, sample preparation? Is it using ATR or we can use other reflection or transmission modes? Okay, so regarding the smallest size, um, with the LUMOS 2, we have five micrometers pixel size, and you can reliably detect um, anything down to 10 micrometers. Um, this is also true for the Hyperion 3000, although we're using having um, a smaller, um, a larger pixel size in that case. So um, you can have different objectives there, and so this depends a bit on which one you're using. So this is a trade-off between accuracy um, from the pixel size and speed of the measurement. If you have an objective with a higher magnification, um, your pixels are smaller, but you will also need a lot more time to perform the measurement. Um, and the next question was the filtration, uh, the, the measurement. Um, so we actually prefer to do it in transmission um, because on the one hand, you have your sample, the light goes through and you have your spectrum in the end from the absorption. If you're using reflection, um, so again, this is my sample, your light will pass the sample once and twice, and you have double the absorption. And if samples are too thick, um, you get total absorption artifacts. So you do not get nice peaks anymore, but they're cut off at the bottom, and smaller features are highlighted that you usually do not see. And therefore, I think it's less reliable um, than using transmission. 
and ATR is not really advised, um, not for small particles. It's a good thing to use for the larger ones um, that are too large for the microscope, so everything above 500 micrometers you can measure with ATR. Um, but for the routine analysis of these filters, it's not good. So you get in contact with the sample, um, your polymer might stick to the crystal and then you need to clean it between every measurement spot and that's nothing you want to have. Thank you very much for the responses. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't see any more questions. So I, I really thank you for the nice presentation uh, and the interactions. Yeah, thank you I, very much. I also thank all the other speakers of the session, uh, uh, you know, and I really look forward to uh, all the deliberations through this uh, conference. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity and over to uh, Mr. Parang. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Vinu, uh, for excellent chair chairing the session. I think we have very good presentations. What is your opinion? It's uh, all very good presentations, right? Uh, really state of the art. I think, uh, uh, I mean, it gives, in fact, I, I, I was able to learn. Uh, uh, we, we are working, we have started to work in this domain, and I really learned a lot about the uh, state of the art analytical techniques for uh, microplastic analysis. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Vinu. I appreciate you know, the contribution as a chair, session chair at addressing issues. Okay, now we are going to have the... Um, let me share the screen. Um, just open. We are going to have a, a 10 minute session break. Okay, you know what you need to do in session break. We're going to visit our virtual expo, or, you know, visit all these uh, technology suppliers and get to know them. What kind of new products are there? Please visit each, you know, there is a, you, you, on the panel, you will see the booths. You click on it, then you select the, any booth that you're interested. So these 10 minutes, <clears throat> please make use of the time. And we will be back in uh, exactly 10 minutes time. Now it is uh, 4 7. So we'll start in 4 17. Thank you all. And uh, I'm going to shift all of you to the uh, you know, session, next session. Day one, session two. And as you know, all of you know that, you know, you know once you join,